Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Catherine Same and I'm an Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at UC Irvine and one of the editors of Jadalia's Iran page. On behalf of our editorial team, which includes Manny J. Maradian, Nagar Razavi, and Navid Mansouri, I am so thrilled to be hosting today's conversation with this amazing group of feminist activists, artists, and scholars. Thank you so much to our fearless leader, our, our really our dear comrade, Bassam Haddad, for supporting this event and our work on the Iran page and the rest of the Jadalia team, particularly Duna Dabas and Kate Greenman for their work on this e event. Thank you also to our co-sponsors, the SCAR School of Policy and Government, the Center for Global Islamic Studies and the Middle East and Islamic Studies program, all at George Mason University, and the Arab Studies Institute in Washington, D.C. and Beirut. Just over one year ago, 22-year-old Gina Masa Amini was arrested and detained by the morality police in Tehran for improper hijab. Brutally beaten, she died in police custody. Amini, an ethnic Kurdish woman, was from the city of Zakez in Kurdistan province in northwestern Iran. The significance of Amini's ethnic Kurdish identity cannot be emphasized enough. The slogan, Zan Zendigi Azadi, in Farsi, meaning woman, life, freedom, is adapted from the Kurdish slogan, Jean Jian Azadi. It was developed by the Kurdish women's movement, which has long emphasized the centrality of women to the struggle for free society. The woman, life, freedom uprising in Iran captured the attention and imagination of the world offering a wellspring of inspiration, joy, beauty, and hope for the countless activists and everyday citizens fighting the connected global pandemics of patriarchal authoritarianism, state violence, and imperialism in their own context. The death of Amini came on the heels of several long brewing crises in Iran, including the profound mismanagement of the economy and the COVID pandemic by the government, sustained water and pollution crises, an extended drought, high inflation, and food and fuel shortages, which for years had been eroding the middle class and squashing any remaining hopes and dreams of better days to come. Maximum pressure sanctions regimes and geopolitical isolation have only compounded the dismal life circumstances of many Iranians and strengthened the state's rationale for securitization against encroachments by the West. Like some of his predecessors, Hard right President uh, Raisi has wrought national security through crackdowns on dissent and surveillance of women's dress. The violence against an ultimate death of Gina, Gina Masa Amini thus tapped the widespread immiseration and profound anger and despair of women, religious and ethnic minorities, students, workers, and ordinary citizens who have lost faith in the reform strategies they invested in for many decades. They were now unified in their demand for an end to the Islamic Republic. Over the past weekend, cities and towns around the world held rallies and marches to mark the anniversary of Amini's death and the uprising, and to draw attention to the fact that while Iranians have experienced heightened security, violence, and blowback from the authorities, the movement certainly is still alive. Today, we will look back at this historic moment consider the significance and many dimensions of this feminist uprising and explore what is happening uh, with the struggle now in Iran and the diaspora. So let me introduce our fantastic uh, discussants. Morishin uh, Alayari is a New York-based Iranian Kurdish artist using 3D simulation, video, sculpture, and digital fabrication as tools to refigure myth and history. Through archival practices and storytelling, her work weaves together complex counter narratives in opposition to the lasting influence of Western technological colonialism in the context of Middle East and North Africa. Morishin has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals, and workshops around the world, including the Venice Biennial, New Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Pompidou Center, Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, Tate Modern, Queens Museum, and Dallas Museum of Art. She is the recipient of the United States Artist Fellowship, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, Painters and Sculptors Grant, the Sundance Institute Frontier International Fellowship, and the Leading Global Thinkers of 2016 Award by Foreign Policy Magazine. 
as one of the Iran editorial uh, team members said, she's a big deal in the art world. So welcome, Morashin. Dr. Esha Momeni is an Iranian-American scholar and activist. She received her PhD in gender studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she is currently a lecturer. In addition, she holds a master's degree in mass communication. Her research and teaching specializations include modern Iran and the Middle East, media and popular culture, and gender and sexuality. Her activism started in 2006 when she joined the One Million Signatures campaign, a non-hierarchical movement demanding an end to discriminatory laws against women in Iran. Since then, she has been engaged in various projects concerning gender in the Middle East. Following the tragic killing of Gina Massa, she has been actively involved in two projects, including Pavandistan.com, a website designed to chart the diverse groups within the movement and serve as a platform for activists to foster connections and collaborate on their work. And Sama Khosravi Urad is a feminist activist and new media studies and digital cultures researcher based just in Sweden, but now just in London. Uh, she is a member of the fantastic transnational network of Feminist Virginia, um, and they've been doing such incredible work uh, in the last year. And Sama is um, feeling under the weather today, but was gracious enough to be here and participate. Um, so we thank her and we thank all of you for being here. Welcome. And thank you so much for your work. Um, so first, let's sort of look back at the early days of the uprising. Each of you grew up in Iran and you've been in close contact with people on the ground. So you have a kind of, you know, a different experience than those uh, uh, who have been in the diaspora for a long time. So what was it like for you to witness this uprising um, and to be in contact with people on the ground in Iran? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Just sort of remembering particularly the early days. Do you want to start, Isha? Okay. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me and um, say hello to um, uh, our audience. Um, so in the past 30 years, uh, there has been a major political uprising in Iran every decade. And uh, I was present and participated in two of them. One was the student protest of July 1999, um, which is known as Kuya Danishka, and then 2009 uh, Green Movement. And both of them just being there and being part of it has been one of the, uh, some of the most profound uh, experiences in my life. But emotionally, every time there is a surge of uprising in uh, Iran. It's very challenging. And it's not just challenging for me. I know I talk to um, activist fellows and we all go through these very uh, hard emotional phase. And, um, and I think, I believe it's, what's scary about it is um, hope. And it's scary because with hope comes uh, also, uh, it invites disappointment and uh, a heartbreak which I think that's um, that's what whenever there is an uprising. But I'm very, this is, I believe this is a different, this is different because I believe in Generation Z. Uh, I think they grew up very differently from us. I think they don't have the traumas that we have and um, they're unstoppable. So I'm hopeful this time, not scared. Um, I'll just go. Um, hi, and thanks everyone for being here. Honored to be sharing this the virtual stage with um, so many amazing minds. So, you know, I think kind of going back to also um, a little bit of what Isha mentioned, um, these kind of uprisings and um, what then became known as Gina Revolution, um, it is not new. We we all have been around a lot of different moments of, as you see, trying to like grasp to, as as you said, this moment of hope. But um, I think one thing that was different with this um, very like specific moment um, for me also personally, but also for, for many, many other people um, was um, this uprising starting with a death of a person. Um, and that person being in a marginalized community, connecting to a whole struggle of, um, you know, um, Kurdish people, 
and not just in Iran, but um, a much more complicated decades of struggles of um, Kurdish population um, in the other parts of the Middle East. So for me, those two things was something that um, perhaps was a, a different shift that then uh, brought a different focus on women, their bodies, and marginalized people. Um, obviously, again, starting from Jina Masa Amini being from um, the Kurdish population in Iran. So, um, but also, yeah, as as Esha says, all those moments of hope come with uh, perhaps disappointment. But I remember this very like drastic um, disconnection between like even like our generation and our parents' generation. I remember having conversation with my mom and her saying something like, okay, this is another of those like moments of uprising. It's going to end soon. You know, nothing is going to happen or change. But um, for the first time, I saw something very different between us as a generation and obviously Generation Z, but also something that happened in the diaspora that um, was very, very different than any previous um, uprisings, which that I think we gave each other the permission to each experience and participate in this movement um, from wherever we were standing. You know, that very popular saying that um, like wherever you are, just take a step forward, which means that we understand you're not in, in Iran. We understand we're not, you're not in the streets fighting. Um, but you are in diaspora, you're, you are in some kind of maybe self-exile, you are dealing with, you know, some kind of connection with, with, with what's unholding in the country. And we will give each other this permission for each of us to participate in this movement um, and this uprising and this revolution uh, from wherever we are, wherever we are standing and our positionality. So um, I think that was a huge shift that opened up um, many possibilities that later on I'm sure we can discuss further. Um, hello everyone and thank you so much for having me and hello to the audience. I am very happy to be here with you and with the discussions today. So if I'm going to talk about my own feelings, uh, there have been quite a lot of affects and feelings uh, on, on me as a woman and on my body as a political body. So um, it has been quite difficult um, for me to kind of digest the dynamics um, of, of this evolving, because as a woman who has lived in Iran for over three, 30 years of her life and who has been under arrest in the same deten detention centers for, for just having um, a so-called improper hijab. So this has been quite uh, traumatizing for many of us for generations and um, for decades. But at the same time, um, this, we know that this has not been just for the compulsory hijab that uh, when this whole uprising and the Gina feminist revolt started, many of us were, were kind of a bit of a hopeless, uh, in a hopeless state because um, quite some, and just in just some years ago, the bloody November happened and um, thousands of people were killed in the streets um, and under the brutal shutdown of the internet globally. Um, um, and which was not known to the global uh, world what happened for days and for months. And also at the, at the kind of epistemic level, I, would, I was quite desperate because I was quite hopeless that why no one is talking about um, uh, what is actually happening in the streets in Iran, what is, what is happening with regard to the mobilizing and to the voices of resistance of uh, people. So there were a lot of uh, these ambivalences, and um, me as a, as a as a woman in the in the diasporic um, within the diasporic communities and the academic uh, world, I was feeling that there is this existing intentional ignorance that is going on that no one no one actually wants to challenge the the regime at all, and everyone is just um, everyone is just so afraid basically. And so when this happened um, in September 22, a group of us kind of organized um, um, an open letter about um, 
listen to the voices of feminist revolution in Iran. And we try to kind of say that uh, this is beyond um, this, um, di this binary of, um, for example, the US imperialism or um, the Middle East um, kind of authoritarianism. This is beyond that. And we need to listen to the voices of the people who are fighting for their uh, liberty, uh, um, like barehanded. And so um, it was both a feeling of despair and suspicion. And also uh, when the time passed, it was also a very much of a liberating feeling for me and for, uh, for many of uh, my, my, my friends and my community. So, and it, it gradually also strengthened this feeling of um, hopefulness and for an emancipation. So I think these uh, different ambivalences and affects are quite important to address uh, right now and that we are sitting together. Thank you so much, all of you, absolutely. And there are several things that you've each said that will sort of pick up the threads and, and kind of carry on the conversation. Um, Hope, I think this question of, of permission in the diaspora, I wanna come back to that. But before we talk about that, can you talk about the organizing going on today in Iran? I mean, you know, sort of mainstream um, media would present this as like, you know, this happened and this is done and now it's all security and violence and surveillance, which of course the authorities have, you know, there really has been an incredible blowback, but clearly, you know, everywhere people still organize in different kinds of ways. So can you talk about, you know, what you know um, from your, your contacts, what's in your work, um, what's going on uh, uh, sort of on the ground in Iran now? Whoever wants to start, maybe we can uh, start, go the other way. Maybe Sama, you'd like to start. Um, I could start to briefly say something about the, the brutal arrest and the suppression of, um, of the feminist activists right before the anniversary of the uh, Gina um, revolution. And it was quite, predictable that uh, the, um, the authorities would go after these uh, feminist activists um, right before the anniversary. But then the, uh, the scale of it was also quite uh, shocking. Um, weeks before um, the anniversary, uh, authorities um, invaded the houses of feminist activists in Gilan, north of Iran, and arrested um, Jelva Jabahari, for example, for Saminia and, uh, and the other activists. And uh, like, even um, Salman Asfari, out of a rank, they are still in prison. Some of them got uh, released on bail, but the, many of them are still in prison. So it's um, it's because of the the anniversary, but also because how, how the regime is uh, is kind of scared and uh, afraid of these uh, feminist activists and 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 ongoing uh, field uh, on the ground activism in Iran. But at the same time, something hopeful and very uh, radical that has happened and um, and has kind of continue to, to take shape is the formation of uh, local anonymous com committees that uh, ha have taken shape in different cities and different provinces. For example, uh, I could mention the revolutionary youth of Mahabad uh, province committee or the anonymous women's committee or the Gilan revolt committee and all of these committees that have found each other, by the way, and are on, uh, and are doing activism on the ground, mobilizing and doing resistance on the ground, is quite impressive. Of course, it's not just uh, limited to the um, to this year, um, to the to the kind of uh, aftermath of the Gina revolution. Um, there has been other um, numerous anonymous com collectives, communities um, who have been. Um, mobilizing for, for years, one of which uh, I could mention, um, Komite Sazman, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the organization of um, workers' rights committee, something like that. So um, these committees have been, have been uh, kind of reaching out to each other and have been mobilizing for years. But this year was quite impressive that even small provinces and even those, um, those cities that are under huge suppression by the regime, like the Kurdish regions, are also um, reaching to each other and uh, mobilizing. So it's quite um, impressive and hopeful, I would say. 
Thanks, Sama John, for those names. I wanted to mention some of um, some of the names you already mentioned, but I would say that um, I like to actually like think that there is a lot of grassroots radical um, kind of gatherings and uh, collective buildings that are happening inside Iran that we actually don't know about. Um, I am, you know, I don't live there, so I it's it's hard to like really pinpoint anything like without like being in certain spaces. Um, but, um, you know, for me personally, since uh, uh, the, the Gina uprising, since last year, at, around this time, um, there has been a lot of trying to kind of build connections with um, friends and feminists and activists, especially like artists um, that are in Iran that are, you know, my friends from the time that I was at Tehran University at the social science department, uh, which was, you know, one of the one of the very like political departments um, in uh, at, at at the university in Iran, um, but um, that has been something to kind of like try to like build some kind of bridge between what's what's happening in Iran and kind of the work that we're trying to do outside of Iran, um, and yeah, so it's that has been also again like a really kind of going back to what i was saying um a very like new experience about the way that we are able to come together um in in these worlds of being inside and outside of iran and i've witnessed that with a lot of other groups that are doing this kind of work that um i feel like to be able to do this work outside of iran it is necessary to kind of find some kind of anchor points and connections uh, with people who are on the ground in the streets or in, you know, in the basements doing the kind of work that they need to be doing. Um, and yeah, so I kind of hope that I will be able to continue uh, building those structures, building those bridges uh, with what's unfolding there. Um, I think uh, I want to emphasize on um a very important change that has happened with this movement and Morishin um, is talking about it. And that's how the relationship between inside and outside. And because 10 years ago, there was all these discussions about who has the right to even uh, have an opinion about political events in Iran. And that's that doesn't exist anymore. And, I, and uh, it makes it organizing in Iran is extremely difficult and like Samajan said uh you know Jelve and you know these are like the activists and feminists that we know and you know we are uh, in contact with it's uh they're under surveillance they're arrested if they're not arrested that doesn't mean they're free because uh you get constant calls you get uh, unexpected visits you have to go you know you get calls you have to go and talk to them so it's like it's not just because they're not in prison, that doesn't mean they're free, um, which makes our role, especially our generation role outside of Iran, much more uh, important to the movement. And I think we, uh, we, can, we can help to create a platform where things can happen inside Iran. Again, many follow-up questions. Uh, uh, I have, uh, we're going to talk about um, what you've all addressed, which is, you know, what has changed in terms of this inside outside relationship, the, the permission, right, the, uh, the, the conditions that led to that kind of feeling of certain barriers being broken. But before we do that, um, you know, as you know, there have been a lot of comparisons of this um, movement to the 1979 revolution. I mean, the word sort of revolution appearing in new kinds of ways here. Um, now, of course, we know this is a different moment, obviously, um, in the 1979 revolution, sort of women's freedom uh, and other marginalized groups' freedom, you know, as in most revolutions historically, was deferred to a later date. Um, but you know this this moment obviously women and girls have been so central and feminism as not just you know uh, capturing who the political actors are but as a kind of you know deep um, vision uh, and practice has been so present so you know this is kind of maybe a, a, a theoretical question but let's ground it in this moment I mean do we have a kind of 
different conception of revolution with this moment. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of fatigue. There had been a lot of fatigue about even the concept of revolution because of the, the you know, the, the many failures and the disappointments and the, you know, the sort of effective sense of despair and, you know, going between hope and despair that, that you've talked about, um, Thama. But, you know, do we have a new model? Do we need a new model? Um, could we think about revolution as a process potentially that helps us toggle between these different modes of possibility and constraint or, you know, was this perhaps the first feminist revolution? You know, um, I wonder if you could speak to, to that, that set of kind of questions. I can go. Um, I think it depends on how we define a revolution. If we define it as a um, major structural change, then uh, knowing that hijab has been crucial to the formation of Islamic Republic identity, this is definitely a revolution. It's a social, cultural, and gender revolution. And um, I like to say that it's that we, uh, to some point, succeeded as as the uh, as hijab. Uh, is not being enforced right now in Iran. And uh, when, you know, I friends, I mean, the way it was enforced. And uh, so, uh, but uh, organizing and thinking about how uh, we can be effective in, in, in a time that uh, states have been heavily militarized and the surveillance technology that they have is, is really, it's not, there's, it's not people, it's, it seems impossible to compete with, with that. And, uh, but I think because of social media and connectivity and internet and uh, culture has, can ch rapidly change and we own the culture. And I think we can, uh, we can, through culture, we can really get to, you know, the political changes that uh, we want, and we, we we observe that in the United States, right? We had how a culture uh, shifted policy changes in uh, here. And, and when I was teaching at UCLA ten years ago as a t as a TA in gender studies, there's the way we spoke about gender was very different than the way we now speak about it. And um, and one of the main changes is the concept of freedom. You know, Iranians have um, seeking freedom for the past 100, you know, 120 years. And in every major political change, freedom has been one of the main uh, desires, one of the main ones. But the definition of freedom has always been problematic. You know, if we are defining freedom, are we okay with sexual freedom? These are all questions that have been uh, asked uh, in different uh, eras. Are we okay with religious freedom? And, um, and every time that uh, I actually did research on the concept of freedom and how freedom was understood and approached in each of these uh, political moments. And um, there was always restrictions. There was always um, there was always concerns with freedom, as if you know, because as as soon as you restrict freedom, there's no freedom. So I think this new generation, Generation uh, Z, because of uh, the different experiences they have, because of uh, the worldview, I think the way they um, understand freedom and the way they're asking for it is is different. And it's, um, I'd say it's, I think they, they do desire and also understand what freedom means. Yeah, um, and Esha kind of go, continuing what you were saying, I think they also practice it very differently than um, how, you know, our generation was doing it. So um, one thing kind of that, you know, I've been thinking a, a lot about is, you know, that that moment of shift from calling it an uprising to a revolution. And a lot of conversations around it, um, as as Isha mentioned, you know, kind of like this this big structure change that now, now happened. Um, but also kind of in addition to that, I feel like, Sometimes we need naming um, 
as a way to then build something around that naming. Um, the past decades, there has been a lot of uprising in Iran, and even the, the, the green movement became a movement. Um, and I think when you call, kind of calling it, naming it, this name of revolution, um, there is something there. There is this, this um, almost pushing for, this is not going to just end. This is not going to be another uprising. This is not going to be a movement. We are going to follow up. We're gonna, we are going to pu push through. We are going to see this as something that now has given us an opportunity um, to shift to 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 change the ways that all, all these like previous other you know uprisings and movements has happened and all the learnings all the these like experiences that we have gathered it's almost like a blood memory right it's um that that we have with us um now we are gonna kind of use those um as a way to um yeah to do something else with this with this moment and that gives me for sure like a lot of hope um um, a lot of uh, pathway it's like opening up different pathway in a way that I personally didn't feel like was was opened up just adding to that um I was asking a friend how it how would it how does it feel just walking in you know streets of Tehran without scarf or without hijab and just trying to imagine it and um in terms of experience, in terms of feeling, in terms of what it seems to me who live there and try it, it's definitely a revolution. It feels like a revolution. Yeah, and and following up on uh, both Esh and Marashin, I would also call this a feminist revolution. And also maybe add uh, what Parvin Ardalon uh, would say, a feminist revolution in the making, because as Esh also mentioned that for a revolution to 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 be realized, we need a structural change uh, to 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 kind of take place and to to be practiced at many levels. But at the same time, the shift uh, that Morishin talks about is is really crucial because uh, with this feminist um, um, revolt or feminist revolution in the making, we see that it's not just another uprising happening in Iran where um, certain uh, demands are um, are shouted in the streets or certain political um, uh, party demands are, 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 are kind of um, uh, asked for. But at the same time, it's uh, precisely because of this feminist aspect of this, um, of this revolution, it's intersectional. It happened at the, uh, at the intersections of the ethnic minorities, at the gender, um, um, uh, gender aims and all of these things that uh, have been going on for for years uh, so we see um we see the um previous uprisings previous revolts such as the um 2017 and 18 protests against economic crisis and uh, austerities we see the 2021 protest in Khuzestan against the shortage of water we see uh, even even those micro political uh, protests like the Sepida rational protests in in the bus and uh, that kind of went uh, quite viral and, um, and and the girls of Angola street movement of course and all of this uh, were kind of prepared this um, um, the society for a moment that the, when this earthquake called Gina revolution happened, people were already demanding all of these things uh, and struggling for and fighting for, for their rights and for their demands for years. And so at the same time, this feminist uh, revolution is a shift because it also essentially re reconsiders what, uh, what is and who is a political, what constitutes and who is a political subject because is it just a male cis Shiite body that can be a political game changer or a political revolutionary? Or can women, trans, um, queer bodies and youth bodies become uh, also political in a feminist and uh, revolutionary way? So I think this, uh, this is quite um, a, a radical shift in the previous um, movements, but also a continuation of that, which is uh, also what makes it uh, quite feminist in that sense. And very very <laughs> impressive, and uh, I agree with uh, Catherine that we could maybe call this uh, one of the most impressive feminist uh, movements and revolution in the making uh, globally. Let's keep on this because this is um, you know uh, such a, a beautiful. Uh, this this is what gives us hope, right? I think a lot of what you're all speaking to, which is the 
the the the kind of uh, relationship between, as Sama you pointing out, you know, the sort of conditions in place for many years for people to, you know, sort of protest and come together, but also what you, um, Aisha, have been speaking to and Marcin as well, the, the sort of the generational component, the fact that um, this generation is part of the world in a different kind of way. And then, you know, so so the social, this idea that we own the culture, we own, um, we own the, the sort of everyday intimate um, revolution. Can you talk specifically about sort of what, what some of those practices are? Uh, you know, I mean, yes, the, the sort of intersectional, the kind of bringing together of different kinds of bodies and people um, in coalition, but talk, talk a little bit more about what you see as the difference between this moment and other moments in terms of those very sort of political or, you know, relational practices on the street. Um, and, and also a sort of related question is, you know, how do you understand the particular feminism here? Is it, is it a, is it a feminism of this new generation? And if so, how, where does that come from? you know, to what extent did, did does genealogy or, you know, or genealogy uh, or the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement kind of inform that deep intersectional, you know, it, it's, it's not just about one kind of body, but all of these different social and political actors. How, how would you, you know, if you had to sort of uh, articulate it, what is the particular feminism being expressed here? You've all sort of said like there's something different. There's we're we're moving beyond this binary, right? Of you know either the sort of Western feminist or the kind of authentic Muslim woman. Um, what what's going on here? And can you talk about the you know what's being expressed in terms of concepts, but also practices? I mean, I think um, calling it a transnational feminist movement um, is something that, um, or wanting it to be that, um, is something that I've been discussing with um, a lot of um, different friends, colleagues, people that are doing this, activists that are doing this kind of organizing. Um, you know, recently I was in conversation with a friend who went to um, one of these uh, bigger con feminist conferences that was... Um, organized by different Iranian uh, feminist activists and one thing we talked about was that you know she felt quite disappointed about actually the lack of um, focus on trans and queer bodies and kind of a bit of still some parts of um, maybe like older generation of Iranian feminist movements kind of being very focused on women women bodies without the X in the E section of women as wording, you know, um, as the focus, uh, which is, again, I think what we don't want to repeat is what we what has happened to us for, for many, many years under a patriarchal culture, which is that as soon as we would want to talk about women and women rights and hijab, it would always be like, oh, this is not a time, just stay, stay in line, you know. Um, so what we don't want to do is that to trans and queer bodies and queer communities and trans communities. Um, who or any other marginalized communities who with this this moment should be um, for all those marginalized communities uh, you know this saying that um, we are not free until we are, we are all free right that's something to really like take with us and um, I I already see a lot of conversations you know feminist for Gina for example um, as like one of my like favorite networks of um you know, different communities coming together. Um, but at the same time, again, I feel like this is a very crucial moment to make sure that we do um, a fair, we bring justice into the way that all the bodies can be included um, as as we we go through this in the making feminist trans transnational feminist movement. Sure, Sama, do you have anything to add? Sama, I can go if. Um, I think um, it's very important to 
question two very dominant concepts that are used to refer to Middle Eastern women. One is equating Middle Eastern women with Muslim women, uh, which I find very uh, orientalist and actually is one of the main reasons that you know, U.S. American feminists have hard time to talk about what's happening in Iran. And uh, and if you in in Iran, if you ask Iranians themselves, Iranian women, I'm I'm not sure how many of them would identify as Muslim at this moment. And the other thing is generations of patriarchal culture. You know, if we um, we know that colonialism and power always rewriting the history uh, to their own benefit. Why don't we question our the way our history has been taught to us, the, rate, the way our history has been told? And when you look back to our history, you actually find that uh, before constitutional revolution, before the modern Western patriarchal state is imported to Iran, uh, women have a good share of power, economic power, because unlike Europe, Muslim women, Islam allowed women to own land. So uh, women had uh, middle elite women had uh, um, and middle upper class women did have economic power and uh, women's uh, the, the uh, uh, women who the workers, they all, they always also participated in politics and, you know, they, you know, women, uh, working class women usually do have power because of how they contribute to the economy of uh, the uh, family. And that when you read the history, there are, if the price of bread in Iran is always, as soon as it's changed a penny, women are in the streets, they write, uh, you know, they, they write letters and they send it to officials, but it's just there's still, our, still, our history is not told the way that uh, it happened. Um, and the past hundred years has been the systematic oppression of women, feminization of poverty. And, uh, and it's for the same reason that every major movement in the region is somehow marked by gender. What is this obsession with gender? You know, Taliban is Islamic Republic. And it's, it's if we were oppressed, why are they spending so much money and energy to oppress us? You know, because when there's, you know, tension, when there's resistance, that's when, you know, that it shows that actually we have power. So I see this as actually going back to claiming the power we had. So we were uh, uh, one of these groups that we formed and ho hopefully I get a chance to talk about it. We wanted to actually name it, you know, Feminists for Freedom, ge fifth generation to just show the continuity of uh, the uh, gender uh, awareness in, in Iran. You know, during the constitution, Iranian women funded the first national bank. Iranian women were at the forefront of uh, uh, tobacco, uh, uh, the um, banning, right, and against uh, uh, Russia. And then, um, so, um, and then we all grew up with powerful women in our families. So, um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, this is not, um, if if we look if it's and 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 also what we see in Syria, you know, like the, with Rojava, and uh, basically that is the first, the most radical feminist uh, event in our history. That's been it's not really uh, noticed, especially by Western feminists. So which also shows the roots of our history. You know, when you look at you know the uh, uh, gender in there. So so I think. Um, it's important that we, to understand this moment in the history, we look differently in our own history. And I could, I could only add to this uh, by, by saying, like regarding the the question that you had, like what makes this um, movement as intersectional in practice? Because I think it's also related to what uh, Insha Marishin. Um, was uh, were saying, but also um, the, the slogan Jinjian Azadi, it originated uh, in the Kurdish movement, within the Kurdish uh, liberation movement, and also the fact that uh, Jino Amini was Kurdish uh, herself, and, and, and the slogan was shouted in Aichi uh, symmetry. And then um, we, 
I think we owe a lot of this, um, the, the progress uh, of this movement to the Kurdish movement inside the country and how, the, the, how it comes from a tradition of years and decades of resistance by these, uh, uh, by these communities. Uh, and, and it is really crucial to, to emphasize on this. And also the, inter the intersectionality of this, um, uh, this movement have been, have been also a decolonization process that has happened from within the country. We, for the first time, hear voices of Baluch women, that's uh, who have started to talk about their demons and the, the, the specific and unique ways that they have been oppressed within the uh, multiplicity of the geography of Iran. And so um, these are the things that makes this uh, movement quite, quite uh, intersectional in practice and in theory. And so, um, yeah, I think this history of oppression and resistance is quite key to what makes this uh, movement be the movement that uh, that it is now. Thank you so much. I, I think we could have a whole panel on this uh, this particular topic alone, but let's um, let's kind of come back to the diaspora and the kinds of organizing that you've all been doing, and um, you know, and and if you could elaborate, you know, why what is it about this moment where you felt a, a kind of new permission or freedom to mobilize? Um, because, you know, obviously working in the diaspora, you're, you're navigating so many constraints, right? Um, but, but this, this moment was so amazing and that it broke that barrier, you know, you, you, you could articulate and feel a certain freedom to be both anti, uh, uh you know, authoritarianism and anti-imperialism instead of, you know, choosing one or the other, you know, depending on your audience, just like, this is, this is what so many people are fighting. They're fighting on both fronts. Um, so um, maybe I'll direct sort of the question in different ways. You know, Aisha, you have a long history of women's rights work and maybe you could talk about your, um, your projects, um, particular Pavanistan um, and then, uh, Maureen, if you want to talk about, you're involved in a lot of different um, art projects, but the, maybe the Begu Collective and and also the role of art and artists in the uprising, which um, you know is such a visual, um, rich visual um, archive of of protest. And then Sama, if you could talk maybe more about your work in feminist Virginia, Gina, Gina, the kind of things that you're doing. So whoever wants to go first, but maybe talk about your specific work. I can call on some. So why don't you start, um, Marishin? Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I kind of want to uh, talk about a couple of like moments that, you know, this shift we're talking about of like this like permission thing that we talked about a little bit, uh, felt like I felt it really like deeply. So the first weeks of um, you know, everything that was like unfolding in Iran after the death of um, Gina Amini, um, you know, obviously there was a lot of kind of internet shutdown, as, as we all know, the Iranian government has been doing this with any kind of um, uprising movements, etc. And um, also this perhaps need for the need that I felt like kind of like this this voice that was like heard a lot that like we need this to be heard globally we need this to be seen um, as something that is like everyday unfolding and like a bit of kind of collaboration between people who were inside of Iran and outside of Iran to you know share these things to put put them outside on your social media I remember a moment when my friend, uh, a really close friend of mine in Iran, every day she would go to the to streets um, and then come back and then would send me videos and pictures of everything like she had like taken on that day through Instagram. And then she would be like, I'm going to delete them from my phone. So you save them. Um, so, you know, kind of like these moments of, again, like almost having to build a system, a network of collaborating with each other inside and outside of Iran as a, as a way to kind of be in this, this moment of whatever that was like happening, but to help each other out for these voices to be amplified, these events to be amplified. Um, 
And with that, I think, um, you know, I also found um, new connections and new network of friends um, that we wanted to do something together. Like we were just talking a lot online anyway, because there was so much emotion to process. Um, and also being in diaspora, there was this very like intense moments of just absolute silence from, you know, as Ish also mentioned, like Western American, North American, uh, you know, white feminism, just in general, I would say like global North feminism. There was this like silent that uh, we we kind of felt like we had to found each other in a way that was very deep. Like I, I still feel like the connections I've made um, with um, other activists, artists, etc., because of um, you know what we want to do uh, since since uh, last year um, is so different than anything else that I've, any kind of organizing that I've done is very different. It's so deep, um, and with Begu Collective, for example, we are a small group of artists, and um, exactly what you say um this revolution has been so visual right the figure the figure of the female body the performative kind of aspect of it in terms of like women holding their scarf or like burning their scarf or like um you know uh making like again these like symbolic visual moments there was this article that came out maybe some of you have read it by l which was about this figurative um kind of aspect of this revolution so for us, when we came together, we talked about many different projects that we we're doing, but one thing that we are working on um, is building um, an archive of images and videos um, of um, the last one year, uh, the important parts of it that have um, women, marginalized, queer, et cetera, bodies as its center. Uh, because obviously there's like so many material we can't gather all of it but we already ha are like building this archive of like you know it will be like thousands of images and material um, and so documenting right documenting these these moments of uh, that I, I think I personally think we could use a bit of like better um, practice of documenting an archival work um, one of the only uh, documentations like video film whatever foot photography documentations of the 1979 um Iran you know feminist revolution has been done by a French a group of like French women filmmakers right so with this as artists as activists we're like we have to build an archive that kind of does justice to to what's happening as much as as possible and yeah so for us that's like one project there are other projects um, but just to kind of end it with with um, this, that um, I don't know how it's been for you, Esha and, and Sama, but I really feel like to be in diaspora and almost not have anything that will give you this yeah, feeling of being sustained or anchored with, with other people around you. Um, friends that I was very close with that are my American friends, etc. cetera. Um, again, like the silence felt like just so heartbreaking. Um, and for that, this moment of finding each other has been, has been really, really meaningful. Maybe I could, uh, I could go because it, really resonates with me as well this feeling of finding each other and um, kind of sharing multiple affect as i said in the beginning that have been has been kind of heavy on our bodies for for long but also this feeling of uh, wanting to do something transnationally and also echoing the uh, the voices of resistance inside the country has been quite um uh, quite key for many of us so um when this uh, Fem Feminist for Gina network um, was was created and um, when people and activists, scholars, artists found each other to form this network of uh, feminist, uh, transnational feminist collective who are based in many uh, cities around the world have, have found each other. They built, uh, we, we are trying to build this network 
um, uh, based on these multi multi multiplicities of experiences and learnings uh, from our lived experiences, but our uh, learning experiences from each other and from uh, our colleagues and comrades inside the country. So I think this has been uh, quite key for, for, for the aim of the Feminist Forgina Network, which is, um, as I said, is quite active in uh, many cities, um, mobilizing for demonstrations for International Workers' Day, for uh, 8th of March, uh, and most recently for the anniversary of the Gina um, uh, revolt. And, and, and this is not just about mobilizing demonstration, street demonstration. It's also a counter um, hegemonic kind of discourse against these um, do dominant discourses in, on, on dominant media regimes. Um, and, and this has been quite key to, to build a movement from below, a network from below that, uh, that tries to, um, to aim for a movement building and solidarity building that is not uh, kind of dependent on certain uh, political regimes or certain governments and so on. And, um, and this has been uh, ongoing since the beginning, since the early days of the Gina uh, revolution with the uh, with the slogan that uh, that has been going on Jinji and Azadi that has been uh, going on for for years but then this became the the Gina name became the symbol of our fight as we as we uh, say it a lot um, in our demonstrations so I, I think this movement building and the countering of the hegemonic discourses has been uh, has been quite key not just within the network but also to find other internationalist feminist uh, communities and networks, not just, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think it was Esha who mentioned something about the blaring of the inside outside divide that has been quite key for, for, for the Gina uh, revolt so far. I do agree because um, one, one thing that Feminist for Gina Network has been quite um, trying to do is to not just uh, build, uh, not just echo the voices of resistance uh, of people inside the country, which has been the, the core element of this net network, but also to build communities and network outside of Iran to those uh, communities and collectives who are fighting against all oppressive and capitalist systems, uh, which, uh, which is not just um, residing in the Middle East or based in the Middle East, they are everywhere and they are rising, the fascist far right uh, forces all over the world, they are rising. So finding these collectives and finding coalitions is quite key for for a network that calls itself a feminist intersectional network yeah i kind of want to add also to that that that's also been a very like important learning lesson that we're not in a canon like what the feminist yes this what's what's been happening in iran this like this revolution is one of the most kind of um perhaps important and uh, vital movements that has been happening in the 21st century, perhaps. But again, to understand that um, this, the history of other, other feminist movements and uprising in, especially in the global South, you know, you look at Chile, you look at India and Pakistan, Egypt, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, we can learn a lot from Palestine and the fight for liberation um, so to understand also that um, connecting with with other um, movement uprising revolutions, other political uh, activists and parties that has, you know, they've been active and they've they've had um, experiences of both um, success and failures and to learn from from those experiences, I think, um, is really important. One of the things that is my in my wish list of project is for us to do more translation work, more kind of programming around these these kind of um, again like movements and um, act act activist um, practices that has been in global south, um, which I personally think that there is a little bit of a gap there in terms of um, trying to again build a network, build a connection with them in a way that feels like we're all also fighting for something bigger than just women's rights, let's say, in Iran. Uh, first, before I beat myself up for a week for giving wrong information, the tobacco protests were against British uh, rule, I, I think I said Russia. Um, continuing what Morishin uh, 
says in, uh, about the importance of finding each other and uniting and creating that uh, coalition and solidarity. I think that's one of the big uh, challenges or, or maybe the main task that we have at this moment. Um, when uh, right after revolution, many groups were emerged and they're mostly still active. And um, and uh, what one thing that I thought uh, really wastes our energy and resources is how we are not connected. In there's no there's no uh, mapping. We don't know who's who's doing what. Especially like we know as an activist, I'm connected to you know feminists of Iran, but so many other people got active who were not who were who didn't have it, the experience. So. Um, with uh, two of my friends, one is a uh, dear artist, Mama Khadem. Um, we created this website, paywandestan.com, to map the movement. And um, uh, so the groups groups go there and they enter their information, anything that's public, um, because it's also always a security issue. So, uh, so we can see where. Uh, which groups and by location. So it's by location. We can see which groups are uh, active in areas. So individuals can, not only groups can find each other, so they don't do the same thing. They can, you know, uh, do, uh, get, unite and, you know, work more efficiently, but also individuals can go to this website and it's like a yellow page, go to this website and find the groups that um, are active in the area or their, you know, inter their uh, transnational uh, and they can uh, join them. It's so exciting and moving. Um, I was struck by someone mentioned the article by Elle um, about, you know, sort of the body and protest on the street. And uh, just to plug Jadalia, that uh, a translation of that article is published on, on the Iran page um, of Jadalia. Um, and uh, something that you know, you, you've been talking about finding each other. It's sort of resonant, in fact, with some of the things that um, that article spoke to about, you know, uh, finding this relationship with each other on the street in a new kind of way. And so I'm struck by the fact that that's happening as well uh, in the diaspora um, and, you know, giving giving you a sense of community that has been, you know, fraught or difficult or challenging um, uh, previously. Um, and, you know, I, I wanna talk about this kind of transnational piece, but also maybe if you could briefly, well, first let me say to uh, those of you tuning in um, on the YouTube channel, please, uh, if you have questions or comments that you'd like our panelists to address, if we have time, we can, we can take those up. So please feel free to post them. Um, we have about 30 minutes left, and uh, but I wanted to um, uh, sort of ask you about maybe some of the challenges or, you know, the part, part of the revolutionary moment, and, you know, this has been true of other moments, I think, in the past um, couple of decades in Iran, but at least this attempt at leaderlessness, right, a kind of, you know, rejection of this ideological positioning or the, you know, heroic revolutionary male leader, um, this attempt at sort of horizontalism that we, you know, saw, uh, uh, you know, in the One Million Signatures campaign and the Green Movement, and, you know, very emphasized in this moment in even a kind of broader, deeper way, you know, because as you're talking about, you know, the, the focus on ethnicity, the focus on sexuality, the focus on gender, the focus on um, lots of different, um, you know, uh, kind of political actors. Um, can you talk about, you know, your sense of that, that ethos of leaderlessness? It, it, has that been um, sustained on the ground in Iran? And to what extent is that reflected also in the work you're doing in the diaspora? One or two or all of you can speak to that. I think I can go briefly about this leaderlessness uh, within um, movement building um, because Feminist for Genome Network is uh, quite a leaderless um, movement and active in diaspora and it's um, 
it's emphasizing on the leaderless and the non-hierarchical structure quite so much because when we want to practice uh, solidarity building and movement building we need to start from the from ourselves so um, we need to think uh, and envision a democratic society from macro level as well regarding the leaderlessness of this uh, movement it's um it's been ongoing um, for years i think because women's um, and other marginalized bodies resistance have has been uh, leaderless. Um, the, we have the girls of Angalaba Street movement that was a leaderless um, movement. There were no um, no big names there. Of course, the, the other um, um, women's campaigner have tried to um, to co-opt uh, certain women's activism, but at the same time, those that are on, uh, that, that are protesting and fighting for their rights. On, on the streets in Iran have never uh, kind of claimed a big name or a leadership for, for themselves. So this unheroic aspect or uh, leaderless aspect of these movements uh, that have been connected to each other is also, as you say, is also kind of a reminder of this feminist aspect of this movement. But which resonates both from inside the country with all these leaderless um, subjects that are, are becoming political more and more, and this desperate kind of activism that tries to stay as non non hierarchical as uh, as possible. Uh, I I want to add something to what Samo John said. It's I I see feminists for Gina and their radicalism. You know I see them as the leader. You know within the movement. You know as a group. So I think um, while we're sorry, there's so much noise in the background. Um, so while you know within the within the group work, we emphasize on uh, non. Okay, maybe is it too loud? Can you hear me? Okay, but uh, but I think the position the uh, position that feminists for Gina hold within the movement itself is is in a position of leadership. So I mean I think that's a really important and interesting thing to raise that it's it's not about you know sort of um, you know no one can can sort of guide or move, but it, it's about this ethos that you're talking about of sort of, you know, democratic participation and, and relationship building. Um, uh, so um, let's talk a little bit about, you've all raised already the, the kind of ways in which um, uh, this has kind of sparked new conversations transnationally, particularly Global South to Global South um, conversations. And we were really struck by that a year ago when, when we did a, the, the panel, you know, sort of beginning days, um, heard from and were struck by the kind of um, excitement that many in, uh, feminists in the Global South felt around this uprising. And it seemed to also offer them permission to articulate something they've long been articulating and that you all and you know Iranian feminists have been articulating, which is a you know a nuanced position that's not just you know about a, a change in government, you know um, only or you know a kind of focus on imperialism, but kind of bringing all of that together, really situating what the struggle is about on all these different levels and. Um, there seemed to be this new moment of not worrying, you know, that you're either going to feed into um, the concert neoconservative, you know, hawks that want to in the U.S. that want to intervene in Iran, or you're going to, um, you know, sort of apologize um, for the regime somehow. So th there was a freedom or permission, as you're saying, to really, you know, just push the politics that have been emerging in so many spaces in the global south that are um, you know very deep and nuanced and can kind of hold all these critiques together um, and i wonder if you could speak to that if you're if it sounds like you know from what you've said you're still finding that there is this moment of being able to articulate this radical and and deep transnational feminist you know very global south um, uh, uh, you know, sort of regionally um, uh, influence politics. Um, and yeah, maybe just if you could speak to that a little bit. 
about your thoughts on this, the, the kind of potential for this, these transnational connections. Um, okay, I'll go. I think um, personally, I have learned a lot uh, from um, Black feminist movements, you know, um, certain people from, you know, Bell Hooks to Audre Lorde, um, to many other names um, that, you know, have been practicing this kind of anti-racist, anti-capitalist, um, you know, anti-imperialist, et cetera, et cetera, uh, practices, you know, within, well, this is like an example in, in you know, in, in, in the Western countries, but also being able to build connections. Um, I was recently reading a um, couple of interviews by um, Angela Davis and her talking about uh, the way that she was trying to kind of understand how she could build uh, a connection to both the Egyptian uh, feminist movement, especially at a time, you know, we're, we're talking about um, specifically also like that moment of the Arab Spring, uh, but also prior to that. And also the connection, let's say here, between like um, the, the, the Black BLM movements to, uh, to uh, Palestine, right? Um, so I feel like there is, again, a lot of examples, a lot of ways that we can use other practices that has been going on for many, many years in terms of building these kind of um, transnational intersectional feminism um, between different, different um, geographical places, between different struggles, and seeing it as struggles that, again, for all of us to be free, we need to make sure that we're all free, right? So uh, building these networks, I think, um, yeah, um, an important way to do that. So um, I, I, again, personally think that there is a lot that we can look into and learn from, from these kind of practices and watching the kind of work that a lot of, um, you know, from feminist Virginia to other um, groups have been doing in terms of, um, collective building, movement building that is not focused on one thing. You know, we're thinking about environmental degradation. We're thinking about economy. We're we're thinking about obviously patriarchy and marginalized and um, other like ethnicities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, I I feel like um, that's something that gives me a lot of hope in terms of uh, what we are already doing and what we can continue to get also better at. Um, I think our major issue at this point is to decide on our relationship uh, with power. And um, I think right after uh, revolution, right after the uprising, the Gina uh, movement revolution, it was, uh, so one of the main issues, one of the uh, questions that people from Iran were asking is like, what is the alternative? What alternatives do we have? And there are no alternatives. Um, and I believe Iranian feminists are in the best position to offer that alternative, uh, considering the environmental crisis, which has already influenced Iran significantly. There are uh, uh, almost 35,000 villages uh, have uh, been depopulated because of water crisis. Uh, and our only way to survive as not only in Iran, but as, you know, as, as human species is to embrace feminist values, which is, you know, not only environmental justice, but awareness, solidarity, inclusivity, intersectionality, you know, it changes our perception about the way we relate to world and one another, you know, it's almost impossible to now not think intersectional. So uh, believing that we are in that position, that we are in the position to offer the best political alternative, uh, we also, I discussed this matter to um, some of uh, feminist friends and we founded a group called uh, Feminists for Freedom in Iran. And hopefully we just added in Iran because we're hoping it's gonna be Feminists for Freedom in MENA. Uh, and the idea significantly relies on the resources of the global feminist movement. I mean, we are, our feminist movement is the most powerful 
movement of modern history. I mean, the, the, the network that we have. So, uh, so if, if we create that network and, you know, if we get the international uh, support of feminists with the theory we have with, you know, all the practice, you know, with uh, the abolitionist movement that, you know, a, it shows us what it means to have structural change within the system. Uh, I think if we use everything we have, we can, we can really, you know, if we get together, if we have that feminist un un unity globally, there's no force that can really overpower us. I can only agree with uh, Esha Morishin because I think uh, regarding the transnationality and the transnational importance of the feminist demands and the feminism that we want to practice is um, key because, because of the climate change and the, um, the multiple crises that are happening uh, globally. Um, and it reminds me of this uh, internationalist gathering in Berlin that I attended as part of this uh, feminist, part of the Feminist for Regina network. And the title was quite telling. Uh, and I think it was one of the most beautiful titles uh, for, for an event. And it was feminism um, beyond equality, feminism reclaiming life. So it, what it says, uh, it actually Wants, wants us to kind of reconsider this sort of feminism as this individualistic sort of empowerment uh, for, for certain um, individuals. So feminism is not just about empowerment or individual empowerment. Uh, it's also about and mostly about um, social and political transformations and uh, structural change. And by this, if we need um, to unite through the global south, uh, mostly through the global south struggles and demands mostly. And there, um, there were a lot of collectives in uh, Berlin as an, an, as an example, people like Veronica Gogo or, um, um, or multiple activists uh, from different um, global south countries in Brazil. And, and it was quite striking the, the kind of demands and the kind of problems we were addressing the social reproduction um, kind of problem, the, the crisis of care and the climate change and all of this and how feminism should respond to this um, globally and in, uh, in an internationalist um, kind of um, unity, not unity in the sense that all of our struggles should be united in a conformist way, but also in a sense that in our multiplicity we, and, and difference, we are, we are fighting for same causes and for same uh, kind of struggles and it is crucial to find each other in multiple ways and uh, to form movements together and to learn from each other's uh, experiences because our struggles are shared and um, our enemies are quite alive and active all around the world i mean i hope that the audience is feeling um as, as sort of moved and inspired as i am i mean that i can't think of a better way to sort of and then um, what the three of you have, have uh, articulated for us. Um, and I love this idea that, uh, you know, as Aisha said, it's feminism that will, will save us as a, as a planet, as a world, as a group of people who share um, so many of the kind of precarious conditions that we're all facing. So thank you so much for your beautiful comments and ideas and for the work that you're doing and I'm glad that you're finding each other and I'm glad that we're all finding each other in this moment um, and thank you to the audience for tuning in and for finding us here and um, we hope we can have many more of these kinds of conversations so thank you so much to each of you and um, keep up the great work take care everyone thank, thank you, so you so much thank you thank you